So with that, I welcome the first group of presenters. Um, Sally Fracolossi, Royce Aldred from Traswater, Sally's from Jacobs, and Annie uh, from uh, Marine Solutions. And it's a demonstration of a collaboration. And their topic is where the sewer meets the sea. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Deepa. Um, it's great today to be kicking off this session and continuing the conversations around climate and environment. Um, and we're presenting today on the findings of a 12-month ambient monitoring program that Jacobs recently undertook for Taswater in partnership with Marine Solutions at Pardo Sewage Treatment Plant in the northwest coast. Um, today, I'll be presenting alongside Royce, as uh, Deepa mentioned, from Taswater and Annie from Marine Solutions. And I suppose it's the aim of showcasing the importance of these monitoring programs uh, for future discharge management um, of environmental impacts. Um, so I guess to move on to the content of today's presentation, Royce will talk to Taswater's investment in ambient monitoring to date, as well as what this means for the Pardo program. Annie will then discuss how Marine Solutions undertook the program by summarising some of the key findings and activities. Um, I'll then talk about how Jacobs analysed the findings to determine um, outcomes and recommendations for Taswater's future discharge management of the site. Um, so with that, I'll pass over to Royce to kick us off. Thanks, Sally. So just setting the context, um, this is one of many programs across the state. We've actually spent more than $6 million on ambient monitoring by my calculation um, since Taswater was formed in 2013-14. Why are we doing this? Well, unlike drinking water where you've got specific guidelines, you've got the Australian Drinking Water Guidelines and the TASI Guidelines as well, we don't have that luxury in the environmental space. So in terms of where we discharge our treated effluent, we need to have a detailed look at that receiving environment to understand what the levels need to be. So there's an EPA process, the Ambient Monitoring Framework, which provides us with a good overview, so we follow that approach. And the idea is, what are low risk emission limits um, like for our treatment plants around the state? So we need to understand that. Got lots of programs in place and we're getting to the pointy end of things. We're starting to negotiate those limits. So we do all of the science, um, which we'll, you'll see a bit more of that in a moment. And then we get to the, the negotiation stage where we start talking to the EPA and um, you know, negotiating these limits. Once we've got those limits, then we can put those limits into our engineering space and those limits will then drive our upgrade program so that we can have a tailored upgrade. So Pardo is the example, is, is our, today's example. Pardo STP is in uh, Devonport, it treats Devonport sewage. It's licensed by EPA to treat 14 million litres of sewage per day. That includes some industrial trade waste as well. So our long-term strategic plan currently shows a budget of $40 million is um, sort of projected for spending in that region. Uh, that may include um, rationalisation or some upgrades at Port Sorel and Latrobe, STPs as well. And of course, you, you can't really spend that money until you understand what the targets are. So getting these safe discharge limits in place is a key consideration for that capital program. Over to Annie. <laughs> Hi guys. Uh, very fortunate that I do love crunching numbers, but I got to take on the field sampling component of this work and pass on that data to the lovely team at Jacobs, which was, uh, I consider I got the fun part, <laughs> which is good. Uh, we uh, uh, went forward with a multidisciplinary approach to monitoring, which included an assessment of hydrodynamics, uh, water quality monitoring, a habitat survey, and an outfall condition assessment. Uh, we deployed an ADCP at the outfall, an acoustic Doppler current profiler, uh, for a period of four weeks. So this enabled us to measure uh, water current velocities, tidal cycles, and wave characteristics. Uh, as well, while the, it was out there, uh, we conducted a plume dilution study, uh, which enabled us to ground truth the hydrodynamics that the ADCP was picking up, uh, identify where we were going to uh, 
put our sampling efforts in terms of water quality monitoring and our biological survey, and also just get an understanding of this particular SCP and the logistics, so how long it took for effluent to travel from the SCP to the outfall. Uh, we conducted water quality monitoring in these sites as well. We've got a site here at the SCP, a beach site that we monitored from November to April, and nine ambient sites around the outfall down the predominant dispersion pathways. Uh, like I mentioned, monthly sampling, we collected water from surface, mid and bottom waters for laboratory parameters and every metre through the water column for physical parameters. We conducted two habitat surveys during the monitoring period. Uh, these were six months apart from one another to characterise the subtidal communities and the outfall around the, habit, uh, around the outfall the habitat around the outfall rather, and identify whether there was a point source impact that was reflected in the biological communities um, down in the, on the seabed. So within 50 metres, we saw higher abundance of aclonia and species that rely on higher nutrient availability, but with increasing distance from the outfall, up to 400 metres, we uh, noticed a significant decrease and a switch of species composition to species such as sargassum that rely on less nutrient availability. During that time, we also conducted an outfall condition assessment uh, where two divers swam the length of the pipeline. Uh, as you can see, it's quite a buoyant plume there. Uh, down the western and eastern side, a lovely congregation of Port Jackson, Jackson sharks were identified. And uh, it, it wasn't to do with uh, the, the structural integrity, but obviously a biological uh, assessment. Lots of aclonia, few, few wrasse. It's actually quite, quite a nice dive. <laughs> uh, so the challenges that we were facing as field samplers, uh, obviously given it's a Bass Strait, we had exposure, uh, which is fantastic for assimilation and mixing of the effluent. However, we did need to find clear weather windows to conduct sampling. Uh, our divers needed to consider the effluent plume and coming into contact with that. So during an incoming tide where the plume was moving to the west, we would conduct an eastern transect and then on a switch of the tide, we would be doing the western transect where uh, the effluent plume would be moving to the east. We'd also drop our divers at the uh, outermost points of the transects so uh, they could dive inwards and therefore avoid that, that buoyancy that um, was a characteristic of this particular plume. Uh, we had holding times, so after collection of the samples, they needed to be returned and analysed within 24 hours. So within, uh, with weather and tides, that was turned into a bit of a juggling act, which uh, made for some interesting uh, opportunities, but nonetheless, got it, got it done. And now I'd like to pass on to Sally. Thanks, Danny. Um, you might think that uh, seeing some of the challenges they faced in the field, we had it easy back in the office, um, but we had a lot of data to analyse, thousands of points telling us different things, and we all had to bring that all together to inform um, some meaningful outcomes for TAS Water. Um, so it was a bit daunting at times, but just like Dory, we just kept swimming, and we formed an um, evidence-based uh, approach with six steps. Um, which was essentially to use the effluent and ambient quality data to calculate the dilution required for the effluent in the receiving environment. We then used plume dispersion modelling to determine the impact, uh, to determine the mixing zone extent. And based on those two steps, we identified those parameters with the highest dilution requirement or the largest zone of impact for further analysis, which generally was looking at trends in the data around the outfall and then uh, comparing that with the biological observations for ground truthing. And we brought all of that information together in a succinct environmental risk assessment, uh, which basically determined the level of impact that the discharges had on the environment. So to determine the dilution, we essentially broke the water quality parameters sampled during the program into two categories, toxicants and non-toxicants. 
with toxicants being those parameters that can have a direct acute or chronic toxic effect on the environment and non-toxicants such as nutrients and pathogens that whilst not having a toxic effect can have a, cause ecosystem stress. Uh, so we calculated the dilution using the equation in the top right there, which looks at the effluent concentration coupled with the ambient environment concentration, which we based off data from those two orange dots, which are sites uh, 600 metres either side of the outfall. And we used that equation to see, I guess, what dil dilution was required to meet specific water quality objectives. Uh, for each category, we determined the podium finishes, as you can see there, and you can see that for pathogens in particular, we're getting some quite high dilution requirements. So then, to analyse how these behaved in the environment, we tried to determine the zone of impact by looking at plume dispersion modelling. We did this using visual plume software, and that graph on the right shows dilution ratios versus horizontal distance from the outfall. And we did that for three tidal states, incoming, outgoing, and slack. And you can see that our worst case scenario there was the incoming tidal state, in which about a K from the outfall, we were getting a 500 to one dilution. So applying that worst case scenario to the dilutions we found to be required, you can see that for toxicants, the water quality objectives are met within 10 metres from the outfall, which is a great low risk result. However, for non-toxicants, particularly pathogens, um, those mixing zone extents are obviously quite large, um, up to 10 kilometres or more. Um, so we referred these for further risk assessment. In terms of thermotolerant coliforms and enterococci, uh, the risk that these pose is primarily to recreational values. Um, so because the pardo effluent isn't disinfected, um, this means that it contains high pathogenic concentrations above safe levels for primary activities, such as swimming at beaches um, or sailing secondary contact activities. Um, even though the modelled mixing zone area for pathogens was found to be over 10 kilometres, we did actually note um, in the receiving environment during the program that um, the ambient levels of pathogens at the nearest beach, two and a half kilometres southwest of the outfall, were within safe levels, which highlights, I think, the importance of ground truthing these models. Um, and as such, um, we assigned a medium level of risk um, in terms of the elevated pathogen risk to recreational values. However, in order to um, lower this risk, pathogenic reduction measures would have to be implemented at the plant. So finally, moving on to the risk um, to environmental values from elevated nutrients, which in our case was um, large levels of phosphorus. Um, nutrients are stresses to the ecosystem. They can cause changes. Um, and the northwest coastline is predominantly mesotrophic, which means that it's moderately sensitive to these changes in nutrient levels. Um, and you would have seen in Annie's footage and on those two uh, photos on the right there that there was quite a noticeable gradient in the ecosystem character around the outfall. And that essentially um, is highlighted with the presence of a clonia or a common kelp and the Port Jackson sharks that we saw um, compared to the top photo, which is more commonly what you would see around the north northwest coastline. And so the zone of impact, uh, the zone of impact is generally, we found to be confined within 200 metres of the outfall. Um, and that was based on the field team's biological observations. Um, again, proving that uh, correlating our data and our modelling with what was observed in the field is important. As such, um, we determined that the area around the outfall, the ecosystem is maintained in that area and the impacts as a result of the outfall aren't having a detrimental environmental impact. And that's why we classified the risk to environmental values as being low. Um, and from these risk assessments, we then developed um, aspirational emission limits, which Royce is gonna finish things up with. So where are we at now is where science meets engineering. So what does, that, what does this tell us about our future upgrade? So we've proposed some draft emission targets to EPA and we've had some um, feedback on those and uh, it's now down to deciding what we do next. So we work with engineers 
deliver this material to them. They've actually had some input into it and, and seen the, the science already to develop an upgrade strategy. So around those emission limits, the state policy on water quality management outlines the principles for setting emission limits. Um, they've got to be set, obviously, at a level to protect the environment. So you figure out what's of value and what we need to protect. We talked about a beach nearby, but we don't think we're having an impact there, for instance. Um, we've got to reduce our pollution as much as practical. But to balance that, emission limits should only be set at a level which drives spending to show an environmental benefit. So an example, 50 million bucks on nutrient removal at that location, would that be a good spend of money? And we need to think about bang for buck because that $50 million spent elsewhere in TAS Water's portfolio um, probably do a lot more good to the environment. And I think that's us. Right on time, Connell. <laughs> Thank you. We have time for a question or two. Catherine, there's one question. Thanks, uh, thanks guys. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, just having grown up at Blackman's Bay and seen sort of empirical changes off the um, wastewater treatment site there where very early on there were no kelp forests and there is now essentially large kelp beds. So it's, I don't think it's been a bad thing. I mean, there's certainly a significant improvement in marine life. But have you actually considered using the increased nutrient as an opportunity to, to encourage marine life and, and deliberately choose marine flora that might benefit from that environment rather than trying to stop it in the first place? We haven't. As you can see, though, um, the fish and sharks and other species do take advantage of the nutrients. Um, it's an inter interesting example with oysters. Oysters like our nutrients. Um, uh, the risk there is with viruses and pathogens, obviously. Um, the other thing that we find happens is where, where you have these small ecosystems and there's fish, you see fishermen as well. So it, it's one of those things that we don't explore, but we do know that it happens naturally. And um, although you don't want to change an ecosystem, in this case, you, you saw the footage, it's um, a couple hundred metres either side of the pipe in the middle of Bass Strait. That's like one and a half kilometres out that you were looking at there. And, um, you know, you've got to weigh that up and, and decide whether you're actually um, doing damage or not. Um, yeah, it's a good question. But we haven't, we haven't explored it specifically, but we know that it does happen naturally. Another one for Royce. Um, <laughs> what was your strike rate on when you sampled? Was the lab results of the plant taken like the week or two weeks prior to your sampling date to see what uh, effect straight away had, uh, like your peaches and that sort of thing? Because there's probably a few of us in the room know how Pardo plant operates. Oh, I can take this one as well. So you'll notice in the um, diagram we talked about the sample points and so we do sample effluent on the day of the sampling in the environment. We also, with the um, plume dilution stuff, we put dye, um, safe dye, down the outfall um, and we determine how long it takes to get there as part of that study. So we can correlate the, the result at the plant on the day with what we're seeing in the environment. Yeah, it's a good question. Thank you. Let's give a hand to the presenters.